at the University of Aarhus in Denmark. Um, Derek uh, is a political scientist. Um, he has a master's from the London School of Economics and MA and PhD in political science from the University of Aarhus. Um, he also has visiting positions in the US uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins and Georgetown University. Uh, Derek is at the forefront of the development of case study methods um, uh, for policy research. And uh, we have been engaging in dialogue with Derek for a while, and um, he has been very good. And um, we, we are um, starting to use the kinds of methods that he's going to be talking about today. So we're really delighted um, uh, that he's uh, able to give this seminar today. He, it was to have been uh, a seminar in person a few weeks ago, as you probably know, uh, many of you will know. And uh, it's really great that Derek's agreed to give it from his uh, study in his home there in, in Denmark. Um, and he's gonna be talking about process tracing. So I'm gonna hand over to Derek. I'm gonna switch off my video. Uh, if everyone can keep their microphones mute and their videos off, that will help our um, bandwidth. And let's be okay. Put it in the chat box. I will play and then we'll ask uh, Derek as many questions as we can within the time available at the end. So over to you, Derek. Okay, uh, thank you. And let me see, has this been shared? Okay. Um, yeah, and I apologize for, uh, I was uh, planning on coming uh, and uh, Denmark uh, locked down uh, right before I was, uh, the evening I was leaving. Uh, gonna, leaving the next day. Um, so I simply got spooked. <laughs> um, and, and so I'm, I'm glad to be here and I hope to be able to come and, and offer a full, full course on, on process tracing at one point. Um, so I've been asked to, to talk a little bit about process tracing and, and the study of, of, of policy. And um, let me get this. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, talking a little bit about how um, different, different um, kind of presentation, a little bit of, of existing process uh, evaluation methods, for example, um, which also overlap with the broader kind of general uh, way of thinking about um, case studies. Uh, and, and there's, um, I would say, a significant lack of real taking process seriously. And this is, I think, the, the, the core goal or the benefit of, of, of process tracing is really trying to dig into different, for example, policy process, understanding the interactions between actors um, and, and, and trying to figure out what's going on. But in figuring out not only the descriptive, it also enables you to make some causal inferences. And, and that would be in particular, the, the, the goal would be to, to understand how it actually worked in a given, given case. Um, for those of you that are familiar with the, the philosophy of science, a lot of what I'm gonna be speaking of uh, regarding process tracing is basically within what one would call a realist or a critical realist understanding of, of science and, and the kind of the underlying ontological assumptions that are that are there. I won't spend time talking about that, but that was just just to, admit to, to put that out there. Then uh, unpacking what process tracing is understood as, well, you can see the word process tracing. So that's, so what is the method? Um, how is it being understood uh, right now? And then digging into the two elements of process tracing. So the first is the more theoretical question of what are we tracing? And then the second will be uh, regarding how we do that. And I'll talk, frame that in the light of talking about um, internal validity and the ability to make uh, causal inferences. But the, and so what we're tracing are mechanisms or, or po processes, policy processes, for example, linking uh, maybe a crisis with a particular type of policy change. Um, and then how we trace it is then looking for the observable traces or manifestations of activities that are left, that, that, that activities of actors leave in particular cases. Um, okay, so um, as an example, um, this is a, a 
for example, a, a um, uh, for the UK Medical Research Council, uh, talking about process evaluations uh, and and then the different types of, of methods and tools uh, that that are typically talked about when we talk about analyzing, for example, policy interventions. And for those of you that are familiar with evaluation methods, uh, these would be things like um, you know, looking at, for example, the context within which a given policy intervention is, 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 is put in place. Uh, this could be using ideas from realist evaluation, for example. Then we would typically have the, the um, in the actual white box would be the cause or, or what is the intervention um, and its causal assumptions. And then we would maybe talk about implementation of the policy and here there is a, a set of different, different methods used there, for example, uh, and, and the mechanisms or, or what process tracing actually is, would be interested in would be the link between a cause and, and an outcome or the intervention, a policy intervention and outcome. Um, in, in, in existing uh, evaluation methods, for example, let's say a theory-based evaluation realist evaluation, these mechanisms would typically be black boxed. And I'll, I'll come in and show an example of this in a second. Um, and then the actual evidence, for example, in particular, if you look at the, the, the mechanisms of impact, um, we would typically use interviews. We would go out and talk to stakeholders uh, and, and get their impressions of what actually, uh, what actually uh, took place uh, or, or what worked. Um, and there's a lot of methodological issues regarding just using, for example, stakeholder and stakeholder interviews as, as evidence. Um, but let, let me show you an example of, of kind of what this, this kind of would look like. It, you know, the, the, the core problem with, with both within evaluation um, methods, uh, like realist evaluation, et cetera, or with uh, things like uh, the case study methods that are typically talked about in in you know, political science or, or in the policy sciences is, is that they do not really answer the how does it work question. And in particular, what a, most existing methods do is that they black box the, the, the causal linkages or what actually is, 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 is doing something are black boxed as assumptions. And the problem with that is that if you don't explicitly theorize like activities, people are, are you know, I, I do this, it then leads somebody else to do that. If I don't theorize that explicitly, I cannot then trace it empirically because I do not know what was going on, which then means that you're at, at the end of the day, it becomes a descriptive analysis unless you're actually trying to theorize and then trace empirically those causal linkages in a process. So this is an example of a, of, from an article I've written with, a, with an evaluator where we were looking at uh, the, a particular um, uh, intervention and, and a, an existing theory, the way that people would typically trace, uh, think about this. And the cause or the intervention is over here. This phase one, you have this coach engages in an analysis with voluntary participants uh, and then it's supposed to lead to a participant on the right-hand side, a participant having increased motivation to change a situation. And the question is, well, how, what are they doing? How do they engage that? And if we look at all of these boxes, all of these boxes in this theory here are just assumptions. Uh, here are assumptions about that the, the, the participant wants to do something. Here are assumptions about their motivations and the choices they make. Here are assumptions about um, motivational levels, et cetera, trust, et cetera. But the, the, this theory, there's a lot of boxes, but it never tells us what people are actually doing. What does engagement, how do I engage with, for example, some participant to make them want to do something? What, is, what are the types of activities that are involved? And, and, and so, so basically this kind of, this causal linkage then is just, just becomes a bunch of assumptions. So I never, if I was going to use this to analyze how a policy intervention worked, I wouldn't have any, I'd just be looking for all the assumptions that I'm assuming are required or present, but I'm not actually looking at how it works. 
And, and my colleague Benedict and I then, then thought about, well, what, how would this look like if we translated this actually into a process model or process theory? And just as an example, uh, these two parts that I've outlined in red, there's a lot of stuff going on here, but basically what we tried to do a sequential um, set of activities. So we have a coach using information uh, and then asking the, the participant to discuss. So there's very clearly theorized activities that this person is using that we can, we, we at least think make sense as far as these in part three, then will lead into part four, doing something, or the person doing something that then, you know, continues the process along. So what we're trying to do in this theory is unpack the linkages, the activities, understanding how does it work instead of just working with all of these assumptions. I'm working right now with, um, with the uh, independent expert group of the World Bank on trying to translate some of their policy intervention models into process tracing. And one of the things I find there is that they'll talk about indicators for success or, or, or milestones, deliverables, but they never actually kind of unpack, okay, if I give a country this loan, why would I, what are the activities that I think, how is this investment, you know, what's the process, how is this going to lead from A to B? Uh, so they have these indicators for success, but I don't know why those are indicators of success because I don't know what people are actually theorized to be doing uh, in the actual uh, case. And so this is the kind of the goal of process tracing is to get that, that type of of, of knowledge is to, to answer the question, you know, how it works. And this involves two then elements. So the core of process tracing, the one is that we, we have some causal theory, a, a, a cause and outcome. And then we try and unpack the arrow in between. So process tracing is not about figuring out what the cause is or what the outcome is. It's what links the two together. Um, and you unpack it, you break it down into parts composed of, of entities. These are you know, people or groups that engage in activities. Then the activities are what are actually, in, in, in more physical terms, transferring causal forces from one part to the next. So, so the, the core of the process tracing is that we're interested in what people are doing. It's the activities that we're trying to, to unpack. And then we assess this empirically using what are called, you know, in, in, in medicine, they call it mechanistic evidence or traces. So basically, if, if I am lobbying uh, you know, a, a politician, that, should, that, that activity of lobbying might leave a trace. It, in, or if it's called corruption, it might leave the, the trace that, that, that I put money in this person's bank account. Um, that would be mechanistic evidence. Um, so this is what process tracing, at least in theory, you know, very, very simply put is. It's unpacking an arrow, unpacking it into parts, entities, activities. It's then trying to find the empirical traces of each of, the, of these activities for each of the parts. Of course, it's a lot easier said than done. Um, to date, I have not seen anybody actually doing, uh, I would say, a full-blown full process tracing in the form of uh, the absolute perfect theory and all the evidence that, that makes us beyond reasonable doubt confident that this is what happened uh, in a case. Uh, it's, it's an ideal type, but it, we, can, we can approach that. Uh, and, and I think there is now beginning to come quite a lot of literature, for example, in the policy uh, policy studies field uh, that is that is really interested in uh, and 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 actually has unpacked a bit more uh, policy processes. You know what's going on between a cause and an outcome, and giving us an understanding of how things work in actual cases. Okay, uh, in in medicine and a lot of my my inspiration for developing these methods and these methods are under development. I just recently got a, a big research four year research grant to continue working on developing these methods. Um, I think they're a little bit further along in medicine. Uh, so there's been a, a, a UK based uh, research project called Evidence Based Medicine Plus uh, involving 
in particular, people like uh, Larry Russell and Williamson, uh, Nancy Cartwright was also involved, uh, that, that actually uh, produced a, 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 a book uh, as, the, as the final product, but where, they, where, where, where they're basically working in the same kind of genre as far as saying that in medicine, there's two types of learning about the world, in, in their opinion. The one is um, what we know from experiments, uh, you know, controlled assessment of the difference a treatment makes. That's one way of learning about the world and answers one particular type of question. But there's a lot of questions that are left unanswered. In particular, your experiment does not tell you anything about how a treatment works. Um, so so the, the process tracing would be this yeah, unpacking what's going on in between your treatment and your, your outcome and trying to figure out the, 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 the um, yeah, the mechanistic evidence and the traces and see how it worked. So for those of you that are interested in, in, in these methods more broadly, this is a, a this, this project, there's a, quite, a, quite a lot of good, uh, good work that they've produced um, that, that, that is, is, is relevant. Okay, so what are we tracing in process tracing? And we're tracing how things work. Um, and this involves the, the study of, of, of causal mechanisms. I'm not a, actually increasingly a, a big fan of the term causal mechanisms because I think it's a quite equivocal term in the form of it has, it's so debated what it actually means. Many people understand causal, causal mechanisms as, as uh, almost as causes, uh, as a synonym for a cause. Um, other people understand them as, as machines, but then you don't really have to unpack what's going on. It just does something. Uh, we can treat them as intervening variables. Um, I prefer the term causal process. And, and that's because then it gives us this, there's a, a, a temporal dimension. Um, and, and that's what we are trying to unpack. Of course, a causal process is also embedded in time and space and in a particular context. Um, and these would be the things that we would also be wanting to, to pull out. But causal mechanisms or processes are, are what's binding causes and outcomes together. To repeat, they are not causes. Um, they are the arrow in between. These are the things that are black boxed in your experiment. Um, process tracing, of course, is only one way of studying causal mechanisms. There are, are people that use things like mediation analysis, as I'll, I'll say in a second. Um, I think process tracing, if you really want to take, it, take mechanism seriously, is probably the only way to do it, um, in my opinion. Um, and, and actually, in medicine, there's analogous uh, kind of the process tracing ver version of medicine would be using observational data to to, for example, smoking and cancer, then this would involve actually observing how the smoke goes into the lungs, uh, irritates uh, tissue, uh, produces mucus, this then produces cellular changes, and you would be actually observing these processes. Uh, and, and, and that would be, of course, something different than if you were doing your experiment. This is an example of, from, from a, a, a published study uh, from Policy Studies Journal uh, of, of what process tracing can look like. Uh, it, this is just the theory, the evidence is not here. And this is a, a, um, an author that was interested in, um, so Olga Lodlova uh, was interested in how um, an epistemic community, here it was within health policy, an epistemic community could influence uh, actual uh, policy. So you have a community of experts and how could they influence policy? And, and, and her argument in the article was, well, a lot of people look at epistemic communities and then see that, that there's some kind of outcome, but they never tell us how it works. How does this epistemic community actually gain influence over policy? And so her idea was, well, as a first cut, and this is a first cut, um, would, would be exploring, is there any evidence suggesting that maybe it's through some kind of actually getting in the room kind of process? So here she has her part one, which actually I think is the cause, is you have an epistemic community, 
that wants something has a has a has a has a set of goals based upon its its um, its its beliefs uh, as as you know health policy experts. Then we have a part two. They they are promoting their favorite policy, but in particular, how how the activity that's interesting is they're gaining access to decision makers. So they're actually gaining gaining access in the form of getting hired and getting embedded in different ministries. And then because they're in the room, this is then part four, because they're in the room with decision makers, the decision makers do not have all the information they need. They rely on the experts. The experts are the epistemic community actors. So this gives the, the, the epistemic community expert actors in the room influence over how the policy then is developed. And then we get the, the outcome of a, of a policy in line with what the epistemic community wanted. And of course, if you look at this, there's a lot of unanswered questions. Um, epistemic community gains access to decision makers. Well, how does that work? How do you gain access? Uh, what, are, what are people actually doing in, in cases? In the part four, what is actually going on within the room? Um, how, how does that work? And, 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 and so the, you know, her article told us something. She provided evidence of this process, made it plausible that this is what took place in, in two cases. But in some respects, her analysis actually, in some respects, raises more questions than answers. Be so we have, we, 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 we get an idea of how it works, but then further research could then probe more about, well, how does access work? How does it work in different contexts? Uh, she was looking at you know, health policy. Does it work differently in other types of policy, maybe education? Uh, does it work differently in different countries? She looked at, uh, I believe it was the Czech Republic and Poland, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so in some respects, good process tracing, it, it, it tells us something, but it often will actually raise more questions than answers. Um, and I think for research, that's, that's a great thing. It's great to know what you don't know. And, and then you can, you can try and, and figure some of that out. So this is, in, and on the, the references here, you can see uh, if you're interested in, in what a, a good enough to be able to be published in a pretty good journal, uh, process tracing can actually look like. Okay, so let's, let's dig down a little bit more into what we know from the philosophy of science about mechanisms and process. So, so again, these are the causal processes that bind causes and outcome together. They are not series of events. A lot of people, when they, when they are trying to theorize a causal mechanism, will just have, well, this actor did this, and then this actor did that, and then this actor did that. And then the sequence is then actually what they think gives them a causal explanation. But just people doing things in sequence is not, it gives the appearance of causation, but it's not causation. You need to see the linkages. Why did, when this person did that, how did that influence the next actor? Um, and, and, and that's that linkage that, that would turn a descriptive event story into actually a causal process or a mechanism. So just you know, saying this did this, this did this, that is not a mechanism. So if we look then in the, in the literature about, well, what then can mechanisms be if they're not just events? Well, there's two positions and, and, and we could spend a whole, whole day talking about this. I'm not <laughs> going to. Uh, but the one is a counterfactual and the second is a productive account. So I'll just real briefly come in to what these, these, these two positions are. So a lot of people, when they, when they think about causation, they, they think it's all about counterfactuals. And this, is, this comes uh, from a, a classic quote by David Hume, where he says, if causation is if the first object had not been, the second never had existed. So the claim is that you can see whether a cause is a cause or a process is a, as a causal process or mechanism based upon studying whether its absence results in the absence of the outcome, all other things held equal. And of course, this is exactly the type of causal claim that underlies an experiment. So people like uh, Woodward and others then argue that causal mechanisms then are just lower level counterfactuals, that each of these parts of a process then should be treated as if it's a counterfactual. And then we would have counterfactual dependencies that then can be manipulated 
uh, for example, using an experiment. Um, so X to the M and then the mechanism to the, to the outcome. And then the, the M is then some kind of intervening variable in between. And then if you're using this kind of understanding of causation and of mechanisms, then this means that you need to assess empirically, the epistemological implication is that you need to assess empirically the difference that variation of your mechanism makes for values of Y across cases, and then controlling for confounders. So this could be a mediation analysis, large and ideally using experimental uh, manipulation. Uh, it could be a most similar systems design type of thing. We, we could use matching techniques to figure out what two cases are most similar. Um, but the core problem with all of these is that they're comparing across cases. So we never actually look into a case and figure out what's going on within that case. And if we look at these kind, this literature, th they never actually tell you how mechanisms are identified, the theory about what's going on in between. They've used typically more ad hoc case studies, so mechanism identification is usually through some kind of within case they maybe call a pathway analysis. But this is not scientific really in, in this way of thinking. Uh, the, the real science comes in when we're first testing. Um, I think there's another way, and there's a lot of people in the philosophy of science that say there's another way of thinking about processes and mechanisms that then has particular type of ep epistemological implications for how we do research and, and the questions that we're able to answer. And this is what could be called the productive account of causal mechanisms, where we're trying to open up what's going on in between. Uh, so we're really trying to open up that black box and it, observe it. And actually the, the, the term process tracing originally came from psychology, um, where psychologists, when they were doing experiments, were tired, for example, reasoning. Uh, the, 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 the psychologists were tired of a lot of what they were studying would just then disappear into people's heads and they didn't know what was going on. So they said, well, how do we get some clues to, to be able to interpret our experimental results about the processes going on, the reasoning processes going on. And they said, well, let's, let's look for observable traces, things like how your eyes move uh, or, or your facial gesture or how quick you answer a question as traces of perhaps some things that are mental processes that are going on that then we can infer that, that, that exist. So the, 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 where process tracing came from was actually a dissatisfaction with the questions and answers that were coming out of experiments. And this would be then kind of the, 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 where we would continue then with this way of thinking about process tracing. And in particular, what we're trying to do at the theoretical level is making clear and explicit the causal logics binding parts of a process together. Instead of just assuming the linkages, we're trying to make them explicit theoretically and then try to study them empirically. And it results in what could be called a how does it work explanation. Uh, so in a given case, when policymakers introduce a particular tax on, let's say, sugar, uh, well, the question is, well, how does that work? What, how are people responding in the real world to a particular policy intervention? That would be the process tracing question. At the end of the day, you would also want to do the, the, the standard uh, you know, statistical covariation analysis, seeing whether this intervention actually made a difference. Um, your process tracing would answer a different question. It would be answering the how does it work uh, question. So in this kind of method, the causal inference and identification through tracing of fingerprints left by the operation of activities within a case is, is so we have both the inference and the identification of the process kind of going on at the same time. There's then two kind of ways that you can, you can think about doing process tracing. And in some respects, I'm, I'm increasingly not very happy with really flagging them as two different types of, of process tracing because in reality, it's always going to be an iteration. But let's just take the ideal type. So a theory testing process tracing would basically, you're able to sit in your office and theorize your, your step one is conceptualization of well, the cause, the outcome, uh, 
in policy uh, analysis, we often have the cause or we have, we know the outcome, it's a policy reform. Um, and then we want to figure out whether we, we need to identify then what the cause is. Uh, it could be a crisis. Uh, and then we would theoretically try to unpack how do I get from A to B? And in the theory testing, then after you have that theory conceptualized, then you would say, okay, well, if this theory holds, if these activities are taking place in this case, what are the fingerprints that we would expect it to leave? Those would then be what you could call propositions uh, or you know, propositions about fingerprints or observables terms mean the same thing. And then we would actually go out and, and, and at the empirical level, collect empirical material and evaluate its evidential value in relation to being able to infer that the activities that we had theorized as the links actually took place. Theory building is kind of starting the other way around. We don't know what the process is. So we go out, we start trying to explore soaking and probing in, in a case, and then trying to make a leap up to inferring that, okay, we're seeing patterns in the empirics. Maybe this is fingerprints of some activity that we then can make sense of uh, theoretically. Um, of course, in reality, real research is going to be um, more of what we call abduction. It would be a back and forth between, we might have an initial, we might start with a theory testing, we figure out, no, it didn't actually work exactly that way. And then we, okay, well then, what does the empirics tell us uh, actually did take place in this case. So in reality, process tracing is often an iterative back and forth. And this slide then illustrates the, the, the kind of the core difference between you could call a variance-based or the counterfactual uh, way of doing research. So your, your, your experiment, you know, your RCT uh, on the, on the right-hand side is basically enabling you, in the words of Nancy Cartwright, to make a claim about it works somewhere. You don't know, of course, whether it works in any individual case, but your experiment tells you on average it works. So, so here are, uh, we, would, we would, the experiment, of course, you take a, a, a sample of cases out of a total population. Uh, you give the treatment to some and, 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 and you know, the proxy or the, the control to others. You investigate the average difference it makes and the level of internal validity or the strength of your causal inferences, of course, here are dependent upon the amount of control that you have in, in your experiment. Uh, and then the external validity questions is, do is it, does this average causal effect hold in other uh, popula or samples or, or parts of the population? And of course, the unanswered questions are, well, local causal effects, what's happening in any individual case? And you're not answering the how does it work question. If you move to the left-hand side, this is the process tracing. This is how it works. We take a, an individual case and we trace a mechanism linking a, a cause and outcome together. Um, it enables us to make a claim about how there's this linkage in the case. Of course, it does not necessarily enable us to say that this is the only, uh, this is the only process taking place but we can, we can see that there is a, a, a linkage and understand how something actually works in a case. But because we spend a lot of time working on a case, the downside then is, well, does it work that way other places? And, and we know, of course, from policy analysis that, that often we, 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 we extrapolate and, and generalize uh, quite heroically. A lot of people looked at new public management and how it worked uh, or maybe worked well in New Zealand, and then everybody else said, well, I need one of those. And it never really worked anywhere else other than New Zealand in the way it was intended. Uh, and this is this, you know, when you really dig down into the case, you often also find that, that it maybe is quite, a quite unique, uh, or at least it can only be then maybe generalized to a smaller set of cases than, than we're, we're typically used to thinking of. The unanswered questions in the process tracing are about net causal effects. It does not enable you to figure out, is this the only cause uh, or, or is this, uh, what is the actual causal effect between X and Y uh, or where does it work? The internal or external validity question is, is typically uh, difficult there. Just to, to put up from, from 
the case based so so the the our ability to make strong causal inferences the process tracing would be at the at the at the kind of the the, the gold standard for a case based way of thinking about how does it work and those kinds of inferences on the right hand side you see the typical evidence hierarchy that we know from variance based research you know experiments the lab experiment is 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 the gold standard and then we we move down uh evidential hierarchy uh lower lower uh, down okay so what then determines at something has a high internal validity it's basically well the strength of the causal inferences and in process tracing this then would be through uh, whether we've actually traced the activities of each part of a causal process, linking a cause to an outcome within a case. And then the external validity question, of course, would be, does it travel? And there's naturally a trade-off between these because the stronger the internal validity of a, of a particular case study is typically when we've really unpacked a process and have a lot of detailed information but then that means that we, this theory then that we get out of this is quite case or context sensitive. It's not necessarily going to travel very far. Whereas if we have a much more abstract theory that we lightly evidence. So if you think back to the example I showed you with the Loblova and the epistemic community, that's a quite abstract theory. And that in theory could then travel to many different cases. But the internal validity, because she hasn't, for example, really tracked how, how they gained access, uh, the internal validity or the strength of the causal inference is lower. So there's always going to be a, that type of trade-off regarding whether you really want to understand how something worked in a particular case or whether you want to have maybe a, a, a rougher mechanistic sketch, lightly evidenced, but that it then can, can, can work in multiple different cases. So the external validity, you would also typically have to do multiple case studies to see whether it's similar causal processes going on. So if we, if we just put on the, then kind of what determines and, and look on the right side, the high plausibility of the strong causal inference uh, category or column here, there's three then things that would, would make it a good process tracing case study. The one is at theory level, you have basically what you could call productive continuity. You've unpacked theoretically each of the parts of the process. In particular, you have an unbroken chain of activities linking the cause to the outcome. Then in theory still, you would have then propositions about evidence that are very unique or specific for your theory uh, and are quite direct. And then the, you have strong sources and full access to the empirical re records. So, in, in that's the ideal typical situation is that you're really able to evidence each of these parts uh, and, and have really good, re good evidence. At the theoretical level, then this, this involves, well, you, you make your cause explicit, you unpack each of the parts in the form of activities, which are verbs that are doing things that are, are linking to the next part. Your entities then are nouns, it could be uh, a government, it could be a particular civil servant or whatever is relevant for your, for your theory. So the parts are factors composed of entities engaging in activities. Your entities are nouns, social objects engaging in activities, and the activities are the crucial. And I can't emphasize this enough, they're the producers of change. And then context in this type of theory is also quite important. Um, this is a, this is a whole, um, uh, a whole lecture in and of itself. I'll just put it out there for now. Um, and to qualify as a mechanistic explanation, you have to be able to explain how something works. There shouldn't be big holes in your causal mechanism. You've told us what the entities are doing. The causal logics are made explicit. So instead of, for example, a superficial mechanistic explanation would be, you basically, you just have, uh, well, it's mobilization processes. Okay, you haven't really told me what's going on in between. That would be superficial. An incomplete would be you really don't unpack what are the activities that are linking each part with the next one. Mechanistic evidence, and this is about getting towards the conclusion, is then the observable traces left by a particular activity. And there could be many different types of evidence that could be relevant, not just interviewing people, 
Uh, it could be meeting documents, it could be statistics or, or many different things, anything that would tell you something about whether a given activity took place. And this figure is a little bit complex, I, I, I apologize, but it, it's, it's linked then into, uh, in, in the philosophy of science, the Bayesian approach, where they talk about a, uh, this, this, this two-step between the, the very, the highest level, the, the, the actual entity or activity, our theory, uh, making propositions about evidence, and then having to, you have to think about and process tracing for each of these thinking about the propositions about potential evidence, you have to ask yourself questions like, do you have to find this fingerprint? If you find it, are there alternative explanations for finding this particular uh, trace or fingerprint? But then you also have to think about, well, going down to, to the actual observational level of actual sources, and then this is all of this kind of source critical uh, type of evaluations, because you could have, in theory, maybe a confession from an actor could be in theory very strong evidence, but if your confession, the actual source, for example, comes from torture, you can't trust it. So in theory, the confession could be very strong, but because your source it cannot be trusted, it's not evidence. Um, so we, do, we I talk a lot more about this in in, in the readings. I'll I'll I'll, I'll uh, share with you. This has been a real short, uh, you know, typically a, 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 um, process tracing when we're when we're. Uh, trying to teach it, for example, you teach it over multiple days, um, and and because each of these, it sounds really easy in theory, but like, okay, well, what does a good process theory actually look like in relation to my own research? Is a lot more difficult. Um, you know, process tracing is one way to study mechanisms. Um, in theory, at least, has strong internal validity, but it of course can vary a lot depending upon the how much you want to unpack the process. Um, and the, the, the quality of the evidence. And it's often typically very resource intensive and um, you learn a lot about a little. Uh, you understand, okay, in, in the United Kingdom, this policy intervention, this is how I think it worked, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the same policy intervention is gonna work in the same way in Denmark, for example, because the context is different. So, so we, we, we will learn about how things work, but it can be difficult to have these theories then travel to other cases. So you learn a lot about a little about how it works. Okay, and here are just some suggestions. I'm not gonna, um, for some from further reading, um, there's a couple of things that I've, I've worked on, an example of process tracing and, and policy uh, studies. Uh, and then there's a book on um, uh, an edited volume that's come recently talking about uh, making policies work and understanding mechanisms and what you get out of that. Um, trying to unpack how things like, um, you know, advocacy coalition framework, how do those advocacy coalitions actually work in given cases? And this is a, a book then that, that kind of works through different uh, uh, theoretical uh, paradigms within the study of policy and, and really is, a, is, is pleading for more analysis that is basically doing process tracing. So I think I will stop there and have time for some questions.